I am delighted to now introduce our commencement speaker, President Emeritus and Distinguished University Professor of Tulane University, Scott S. Cowan. Scott is a native of New Jersey who earned his undergraduate degree at the University of Connecticut before declining, I repeat, declining a graduate student deferment to enroll in officer candidate school with the U.S. Army. He later earned his master's and doctorate degrees in business at George Washington University, then taught at Bucknell University and the University of Virginia. He arrived in Cleveland as a faculty member in 1978 and became our dean six years later. His tenure at the Weatherhead School included nationally recognized curriculum reform, significant growth in applications, and a gift from innovative executive and philanthropist Peter B. Lewis to provide a stunning new home for the Weatherhead School of Management. Scott is a beloved and legendary leader of the Weatherhead School, who has proved to be a very tough act to follow. While at Tulane, Scott initially made headlines for his advocacy of strong academic standards in Division I athletics. His response in the wake of Katrina, however, propelled him to far greater prominence. He stayed on campus so long in August of 2005 that his eventual escape from the rising waters involved a boat, golf cart, dump truck, and helicopter. Working from a makeshift administrative office in Houston, he worked with school leaders to find Tulane student spots at other campuses for the fall semester, and then to ensure Tulane reopened in the spring despite $650 million of storm-related damage. Doing so involved massive fundraising, reassurance of students and families, and a drastic renewal plan. In January 2006, more than 80% of the first-year students returned, and more than 90% of all students did. That in itself is an incredible leadership story. Beyond his efforts for Tulane, Scott also engaged in supporting his city in its recovery. He served on the Bring New Orleans Back Commission and traveled widely to tout the city's revival to national leaders. He also directly led efforts to renew New Orleans' struggling school system with great results. In recognition of his leadership, Time Magazine named him as one of the 10 best college presidents. 2009 also saw Scott win a Carnegie Corporation Academic Leadership Award. A year later, he received New Orleans' prestigious Loving Cup for his contributions to the community. He was also elected as a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences in 2010. This year, meanwhile, he published the book, The Inevitable City, The Resurgence of New Orleans and the Future of Urban America. His book chronicles his role in leading Tulane and the city after Katrina and is one of the finest and most inspiring books on leadership that I have read. I strongly recommend it to you. Scott recently joined the CWRU Board of Trustees and continues his never-ending quest to give back. Scott, we're thrilled to have you and Marjorie here. Welcome home. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a great honor for me to join all of you on this very festive and momentous occasion in your life. By the way, during my career as a dean and president, I have presided at 30 commencements, 14 at the Weatherhead School of Management, and 16 as president of Tulane University. One of the key lessons learned from this unique experience that any commencement speaker should buy, that is that any commencement speaker should buy by three basic principles. I refer to them as the three Bs. Be genuine, be brief, and be gone. <laughs> we will now see whether I really learned that lesson. Like you, this is a poignant moment for me since I left the Weatherhead School 17 years ago to become president of Tulane University. My memories of CWRU, Weatherhead, and Cleveland are vivid and a sustaining force in my personal, personal life 
just as I hope they will be for all of you. While I didn't receive my degrees from CWRU, the education I received through my experiences and friendships were powerful influences in my development as a person and a leader. They also prepared me to overcome the greatest challenge of my professional life, Hurricane Katrina, which occurred in 2005. Since that great tragedy, I have reflected on my career and what themes have seemed to characterize my development as a person and professional. I've narrowed the list to five and share them with you for what they are worth. They represent neither best nor worst practice, but hopefully one or more will resonate with you. Reflection number one. Whatever successes I've had in my life, they are due in large part to the adversity I've overcome and the mistakes I have made. Last year, when I gave the last lecture at Tulane University, I disclosed publicly something I had never disclosed before. And that is that I could neither read or write until I was in the third grade. And it was, I was diagnosed many years later with dyslexia, and I've lived my life with it. As I reflect back on that experience as a young child growing up, where everyone thinks you are either lazy or stupid or something else, it has an impact on you. And it either destroys you or it makes you stronger. In my particular case, I developed the coping mechanisms I needed to overcome it. And many of those coping mechanisms were the very things that helped me get through Katrina and other things in my life. There is this old saying that what does not defeat you makes you stronger. I believe in that. I would not wish for any of you any adversity in your life or any big mistakes. But when they come, look for the silver lining, because every one of them has a silver lining. And out of that silver lining, you will grow and develop in ways otherwise not possible. Reflection number two. My career path was based more on serendipity and opportunity rather than careful planning. This is really a confession to make in front of a bunch of MBAs, doctoral students. I didn't have a plan. Two weeks ago, I was giving a lecture on campus at Tulane University, and a student raised her hand and asked me a question I had never been asked before. The question was, when did I know I wanted to be a university president? <laughs> and I said, the year after I was one. <laughs> they were astonished by that because they thought that I had had some game plan ever since my MBA degree all the way to the presidency. But here's the truth. When I sought my MBA degree, I did it because I wanted to be an investment banker. But somebody convinced me instead to get my doctoral degree. When I got my doctoral degree, I really did it because I wanted to be a consultant. Someone convinced me to be a professor, and the rest is history. <laughs> so what's my point here? Don't worry if you don't have a plan for your career. Just make sure that whatever you do, you do well, and thereafter follow your instinct and your passion. Reflection number three. Some of the greatest leaders I have ever known were not the smartest people in the room but they were often the most passionate and driven, and they usually possessed a high degree of emotional intelligence. And I didn't say that just because Professor Boyatzis is up here, <laughs> even though I learned a lot about emotional intelligence from Richard when I was a professor here. But what they do is they have these three great attributes. They're unbelievably inquisitive, they are great listeners, and they are lifelong learners. And out of that experience of those three actions evolved some of the greatest leaders I have ever seen. Beware of those in the room who think they are the smartest in the room. They are often the least effective because they think they have all the answers and they rarely do. And since I wasn't the smartest in the room, I sure as wanted to make sure I wasn't the dumbest in the room. And fortunately for me, it worked out I was probably at the median. Reflection number five, look for and learn from great mentors. When I was in Cleveland and at CWRU, I learned about the power of mentorship. 
I was fortunate to have several outstanding mentors during my time in Cleveland, and what I learned from them was my guidebook for leadership. A few of them are on the stage today. I mentioned Richard Boyatzis, and I mentioned Gary Previtz, who served for a long time as chair of the accounting department at the Weatherhead School. I will mention Celia Weatherhead and her husband, Albert Weatherhead. Both were mentors to me for over 40 years. I would not be here today without their mentorship and their friendship. Seek out mentors if you do not have them. Mentors are the gift that will give forever and they cost you nothing. And even at my ripe old age, I'm constantly looking for mentors and I'm not looking necessarily now for people who are older than me. I look to those who are younger than me because they have the spirit and the wisdom of their time and of their youth, and perhaps there is something I can learn from it. My last reflection really comes from my days in New Orleans and at Tulane. This is where I truly learned about resilience, empowerment, engagement, and indirect leadership. Let me say a few words about Katrina. Katrina is the worst man-made disaster in the history of the United States. 80% of the land mass of Orleans Parish was flooded for 57 days. By the way, 80% of the land mass of New Orleans is the equivalent of seven times Manhattan. So imagine Manhattan being flooded for 57 days, but multiply it by seven. There were 470,000 people living in New Orleans when Katrina happened. Within three weeks, there were 10,000. There was over $200 billion worth of damage, and most people in America, especially in Washington, D.C., thought New Orleans would never recover, and many people thought Tulane would never recover. It is during that time that I learned what the word resilience meant. It is during that time I learned what the word grit meant. And by the way, we weren't looking to the federal government or the state government or the local government to bail us out. We had to do it ourselves. And that's where the idea of indirect leadership comes about. We think about leadership who are people who are CEOs of companies or organizations, presidents of universities. Well, we fail to realize that every one of us, no matter who you are, no matter what age you are and what your occupation is, you, by your example, can and should be a leader. And by doing so, you will inspire others. What saved New Orleans in the end was the power of one, literally hundreds and thousands of individuals, through their individual effort and collective effort, saved that city. That's where I learned about empowerment. And that's where I learned about engagement. I would say this to you, and I've said it to dozens of students over 30 years. No one will ever remember you for what you did for yourself. They will only remember you for what you did for others. So whether you graduate today and go on to be a highly successful hedge manager making billions of dollars a year, God bless you, just remember to give a piece of it back to Case Western Reserve University. <laughs> or if you decide to go out and do something in a nonprofit section, remember, you are privileged. You are privileged not because you came from wealth, not because you had an easy life, but you are privileged because you are sitting here today graduating from one of the finest universities in the country. And with that privilege comes obligation. That is what I learned. So with the rest of my career and my life, I will continue to devote my energies, in my case, to public education and to young people, to give back so they will have a better life than otherwise would have been cast for them. Now, I have to say one little story about something Dean Whiting said. Dean Whiting said when he introduced me that I evacuated from New Orleans with a golf cart, a boat, a truck, and a helicopter. This is all accurate. There was a little detail he left out. One is, uh, to get the golf cart to work, we had to take a battery out of another car that was abandoned and put it in the golf cart. And to get 
uh, the truck to work, we had to siphon gas out of other cars and put it in the truck. And then to get the helicopter, we had to spend three days hailing down the helicopter to finally escape from New Orleans. Now, a week after that event, I was on NBC News. And one of the newscasters said to me, I understand you got out of the city this particular way, describing it just as I did. He said, I don't understand how a university president has the skills to do all of those things. <laughs> and I said, first of all, I was never born a university president. But I was born and raised in New Jersey. <laughs> so for those of you, So for those of you from Jersey, you know exactly what I'm saying. And by the way, I, you know, I was from South Jersey, so when I moved to New Orleans, I fit right in. But that is the true story of what happened. But it does not distract from the idea of giving back. There's an expression in Hebrew that says, tikkum olam, repairing the world. That is what you should be advocating for and doing yourselves as you go through your career. The last lesson I'm still learning is how to properly balance my personal and professional lives, especially when you love both, where you love your family, but you love what you do. What I've learned so far is that one without the other can lead to self-doubt about your priorities and values, and oftentimes unhappiness, especially as you age. For me, my wife, Marjorie Cowan, class of 82, Weatherhead School of Management, MBA, she has been my personal and career partner for 25 years. This is a partnership that I sometimes take for granted, but fortunately, she has always kept me grounded and reminds me in her quiet but unbelievably forceful way that life is a work in progress and I better continue to evolve accordingly. In fact, whether you are 25 or you are 70, life remains just that, a work in progress. As long as we will all remember this, there's always an opportunity for growth, development, and self-fulfillment. In fact, as I am approaching the young age of 70, I still wonder what I want to be when I grow up. By the way, this keeps me young, at least in mind, if not body. I recommend it to all of you. Lastly, I would say to each of the graduates, you have achieved a great deal to get to this point in life, and there are so many more things that you will achieve in your life. I just hope for you that you enjoy your journey as much as I have enjoyed mine. Just remember one thing. The scarcest resource you have in life is time. And it goes by very, very quickly. Sever every moment because time is irreplaceable. Congratulations to the class of 2015. Scott, thank you for your profound and uplifting advice. You know, the school strives to develop leaders who innovate to create sustainable value and are good global citizens. On that innovation, uh, I think we learned a little bit about something about um, how to get out of New Orleans in a variety of interesting and effective ways. But thank you for, thank you for serving as a role model, Scott, for the school. <laughs>